If I were to have a thesis, really, for what we've been talking about over the last, you know, six, eight weeks, it's this, that we want you to let joy in, and we want you to push some stress out. Anybody ever had a little bit of stress in your life? Thank you for your honesty if you raise your hand. We all have. We've all had stress. And so this season has been about pushing it out a little bit and letting some joy into our lives. And so uh, this series that we've done for the last three weeks, Can't Seal My Joy, we've talked about a variety of topics that seem to really let some stress in. That there are multiple things in our lives that can try to attack us and really want to kill the joy in our lives. They want to be killed joys in a great big way. We talked about time. We talked about work. And today, I thought, since only the true Christians come on Memorial Day, we'll talk about money because you won't be offended, all right? If it was a visitor they came last week, they'd have been super offended. So, no, I'm just joking. I want to talk about money. Anybody ever been stressed with money? Now, here's the good news. Before you feel like you need to sneak out like you're going to the bathroom, right, and not come back, I'm not asking you for anything today. You do not have to get your wallet out. There is, if you have a checkbook still, all right, get with the times. You do not, no, I'm just joking. You don't have to write a check today either, all right? But I'm not asking anything from you. I've been telling you over the last three weeks, we really want to help you. And so that's what I hope to do today. If you are currently stressed, with money, I hope to help you. Uh, Because here's the thing, I don't know if you're anything like me, but you know what, I just always have too much of it. I mean, it's just part of, I'm joking, by the way. Um, It's just part of my life, and maybe you're in here today and you would say that's true about yourself as well. I'm gonna guess, though, that the majority of you, you have been stressed in the area of finances at least at one time or the other. And you would say, you know what, I just, I don't have enough of it. And this is a little bit of a stressful tension in my home or a stressful topic in my home, and it's really pushing some joy out, and uh, so that's what we want to talk about. According to the American Psychological uh, Association in 2022, all right, so this is a a two-year-old statistic now, it said this, that 65% of those surveyed said money was a significant source of stress. Stress about money is the highest that's been recorded since 2020, 15, and this was two years ago. You know what's happened in these last two years? Some big word called inflation. So I'm assuming the 65% is probably a little higher at this point, meaning everybody's went to the gas pump at one time or another unless you drive a Tesla and thought, I don't like this. I don't like how it feels. My wife went the other day and had to call me because literally one gas station was a dollar more than the one down the street. Now, they must have gotten in trouble because they quickly changed that price. But it can be stressful at times. It can be stressful when groceries are going up and, you know, the, you know, the gas prices are going up and all of those things. And so, you know, every time uh, or a couple times a year, uh, we do small group semesters. So we have them in August and then we'll do them again in January. And we try to always offer something that we call Financial Peace University. It's a small group that just helps you learn to have peace when it comes to your finances. Now, here's the interesting thing about Financial Peace University. Um, not only... Do, do, do we offer it? But we offer it really because of the response we get from people. So uh, at Easter, we took a survey. And at the end of our Easter message, we surveyed people. And we just said, hey, what are some topics that would be of really big importance to you? And you know what's funny is so many people talk about finances. I mean, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and, and what's interesting about it is not only during that survey, but also in 21 Days of Prayer, as I read through these cards in August and January, a ton of them have to do with money. And so we offer Financial Peace University a couple times a year, but what's funny about it is nobody shows up to it. It's one of the most talked about things on surveys, one of the most requested things for prayer, but then when there's something that can help you in this idea, you don't come to it. Now, this is not a rebuke, all right? So let me, let me just track with me here. Here's why. Here's why I think people don't come. Shame. I think they feel like if they come, everybody's going to judge them. If they knew the debt I had, if they knew the mess my finances were in, if they knew the struggle I had paying for my bills, I'm, I'm going to feel less than I'm going to be embarrassed of my spending habits. I don't really want to know because if I know, then I got to be responsible for knowing because now if you know, you know, and you got, you know what I mean? And so sometimes there can be so much shame around it that it keeps us from getting the help that we need. And then what happens is we end up night after night slouched into the easy chair 
at our house thinking this as we look at our online banking. How in the world did I get here? How in the world did we get here? How in the world did my money get here? And you're not saying there's too much of it. You're living a life of there's not a much, enough of it. And so I want to help you today, all right? I want to help show you some biblical principles. Since there is a lot of shame sometimes around going to financial peace, I want to give you in like 27 minutes and 23 seconds as much of 13 weeks worth of content as I can give you so you can have some financial peace, all right, in your life. Because I want you to let the stress out and I want you to let some joy in. And when you have joy in the area of your finances, it will bring you a peace that, man, I promise you, I promise you, once you get that, you will long for that, and it will change the way that you manage your money. So what I've learned when it comes to finances, and I've learned this the hard way, and what I want to share with you the next few minutes is things that you probably learned the hard way as well. But there are a lot of financial joy stealers in our lives, financial decisions that we can make that actually steal joy from us. That when we make these decisions and we make these actions, they leave us feeling stressed and they leave us feeling a lack of joy. And I want to look at a story that normally you wouldn't look at when it comes to money. It's found in Luke chapter 15, and there's three stories, three parables that Jesus talks about. We've got the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then we have the parable of the prodigal son. I want to look at the prodigal son because set underneath the backdrop of a loving father that is waiting for a wayward son to return home is a big story of money. See, the whole prodigal son story actually sets itself up around the idea of finances. I want you to see this. Luke chapter 15, we pick up this story in verse number 11. It says, Jesus continued. What did he continue? He continued teaching a parable. He said, there was a man that had two sons, and the younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So what he's referring here to is, hey, I want my half. I want my cut. To which the crowd in this time would have been, this would have been a big shocker. I mean, they would have gasped. As soon as Jesus began to tell this parable, the crowd would have been like, oh. it would have been a big deal. It's as if he was saying, and I don't mean to be too strong here in the language, it's as if the son was saying, it's like, I kind of wish you were dead and I had my inheritance now. And so would you give me my half? Would you give me my portion? And I don't just want more than what I have right now. I kind of want it right now. So he divided his property between them. And so the father turns over half of the wealth there to this, this one son. And so the first financial joy killer or stiller that I want to go through as we kind of trek through is this. Number one is, 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 is the thing that will just, it'll really rob your joy financially. Is when you always want more and you want it now. When you always want more and you want it now. See, I don't know about you, but if from a very young age, if you have kids, here's, here's what I'm learning with my seven-year-old. I don't want some. I want more. Yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting is we never grow out of that. Yeah. Now, we don't say it like the seven-year-olds do. We may not be walking through life saying, more, 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 give me more. Yeah. Right? But we think that. We look at social media, we look at other people's lifestyles, we look at what we wish we had, and there is this thing in us that does want, want more. And so my son, it's interesting, I mean, you can give him 25 Chris, you know, presents at Christmas times, or Christmas time, and when he opens the 25th present and he looks at it, two minutes later, you know what he says, is there anything else? You got any more for me? And just like I said a couple weeks ago when we were talking about time, as I said this when it comes to time, we've got to stop the constant push for more in our lives. Yeah. I think the same is true when it comes to our finances, when it comes to obtaining stuff in this life. We have to be very careful, not just always wanting more. Right. We read this scripture in Ecclesiastes, and I think we can apply this to the area of our finances as well. It says this, maybe so, but it is better to have a little with peace of mind than to be busy all the time, working with both hands, just trying to catch the wind. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this, those that love money will never have enough. See, I don't want to be somebody that, that, that is so in love with money where I think that money 
is what creates happiness. And money is what creates joy. And money is what creates peace in my life. Because the Bible says, if I fall too much in love with the pursuit of that, it'll actually leave me empty because I'll never have enough of it. How meaningless is it to think that true wealth, the Bible says, brings happiness. So it's not only the constant push for more, and you don't need me to go through a list of things. You know what the more is in your life that you're constantly pushing for and striving for. It's the idea of keeping up with the Joneses. But it's not just the constant push for more. I would say also, and in the first service, there was a whole row of young adults up here. And I looked at them and I said, it's not just the constant push for more. It's also the constant push for now. Yeah. That we, we don't just want more, but we want it right now. Yeah. For all the 20-somethings in the room, I just want to help you really quick, okay? Stop being so stressed out when it comes to the area of your finances because you don't have what your parents have. I get it in a world full of influencers, in a world full of like get up and grind and work hard and be a 20-year-old billionaire. Stop getting stressed when what your parents worked for for 25 years to get that house you don't have yet. Maybe they sold a couple houses and had a few investments along the way and there was a process in which to get there. They probably just didn't stumble on it. But I know so many young adults that are living so stressed financially is because they don't just want more, but they want everything right now. I get it. Who doesn't want the nice house? Who doesn't want the nice car? Who doesn't want the things that we see those, you know what I mean? But that pursuit, man, it will rob you of joy in your life. There has to be seasons in your life where you just, you own them and you realize you got to act your age sometimes. Or act your wage, maybe. When Jennifer and I first got married, we were 19. I did not have the house that we have right now, guys. Almost 20 years of marriage now. No, we lived in a little one-bedroom apartment that um, I don't really know how the rent worked, but every month that we kept the utilities beneath a certain amount, they actually gave us money. It was the weirdest thing. He was like trying to teach us how to turn down the AC. It was a, the weirdest thing. But we couldn't even afford furniture, and so they just kind of left their old furniture there, which was the pink house. I mean, it was the pink couch, or the pink couch, sorry, apartment. And you know what? That pink couch, couch was hideous. It would, it would be on somebody's, like, flip page right now on Instagram, you know, where it's like trash to treasures. Nobody would sit on it. You, even if you are artsy and vintage and eclectic, you would not want this in your house. But it was our season. And we loved that pink couch. And you know what? It, it was what we had in the season that we had it. And did I want something nicer? Absolutely. But a lot of us are in such a push for more and such a push for now. We bring our own stress financially upon ourselves because we're not content. We'll talk about contentment here in a minute. And so here the prodigal son is. He wants it now. He wants more, and then it goes on and it says this, that not long after what? Not long after that. And so his father gives him his inheritance, right? He gets half the estate, and it says not long after he receives it. We don't know exactly how much time, but the younger son, he says he gets, you know, gets all of his stuff together, and he sets off for a distant country. And when he gets there, the Bible says that he squanders his wealth, his inheritance, in what? In wild living. And so we talk about the idea of the prodigal son and how crazy he went and all that stuff and what a bad child. But let's not skip past the fact of what did he really do here. He took everything in which he wanted so badly and wanted it right now and wanted them more. And he squandered that. He squandered the very thing that he thought would bring him happiness. The message version says it this way. They're undisciplined. A huge part of our finances and our financial joy is learning to be disciplined. They're undisciplined and dissipated. He wasted everything he had. Here's a second joy killer for you. When it comes to your finances, if you engage in wasteful spending, it will rob joy in your life. Now, I don't have to tell you what that is, all right? I'm not going through a list of like, you need to stop eating out and going to Starbucks. Go to the Dave Ramsey class. He will be very specific on what you should not do. He will help you, all right? So I only got 18 minutes and five seconds for that, but you know what this is. Now, when we grew up, 
we barely, you know, when Jennifer and I first got married, um, you know, banking and like online banking, it was a very new thing. And so we couldn't just, you know, swipe the card and, you know, tell us when we were broke. We had to keep track of it. And they gave you something called a registry. I mean, total, I, you, most of you guys don't even know what that is. You would swipe your card or you would write, we had checks before we had debit cards. You write a check and you had to write it down. And so literally, and if you didn't, you were really big trouble, all right? But if you wanted to manage your finances in any way, when you swiped, you wrote it down. And it was so much easier to track wasteful spending than it is today because now the way we track is, uh uh-oh, it was declined. I guess we don't have anything. You know what I mean? (laughs) See, stress financially comes often when we engage in self-destructive spending. So it's the spending that, that wasn't bad to go to Starbucks. It wasn't bad to go out to eat. It wasn't bad, but it was self-destructive if you didn't know what you were doing with it. If it was... See, what is wasteful to me and wasteful to you also may be two different types of waste. And so where one might have the margin to get a Starbucks every day, you may not need to do that. That may be wasteful when it comes to your finances. And so here he is. He wastes everything he had, Luke 14. It says, and after he had spent everything he had, all right? So he doesn't only engage in wasteful living. He spends all of it. Number three is this. Just spend everything all the time. I'm just trying to help you, all right? I have been stressed before, and I understand what stress is like when there's more bills and no money. And so I've got to learn to discipline in my life. See, he was undisciplined. And when he was undisciplined and engaged in wild living and reckless spending, it led him to a place of having nothing. And so we think, if I could just get a better job, if I could just get more money, if my boss would just give me that 50 cent raise, if I would just hit that bonus at work, that that will fix everything. But the bonus may not fix everything. A couple dollars an hour may not make the big difference that you need. It may not just be about getting a new job and higher income. And maybe there are some goals in your life that you want that literally you will not have happen if you stay in the job that you're in. You may need a career change to, you know, accomplish those financial goals. But if you don't track and you don't budget, I know that's like a four-letter word we'll talk about in a second. But if you don't engage in that, you might end up in a place where you spend everything you have. And it's in that moment that look what happens. It, It wasn't while he had a lot. But it was while he had nothing that a famine came. A severe famine came into the land. I love the timing of that. I feel like that's like the Bible, like it reads our mail. Because isn't that when famine happens in your life too, when you feel like you have nothing? Very rarely does famine happen in times of plenty. It's usually when I'm at rock bottom that it's like, oh man, kicking me while I'm down? It was a severe famine in the whole country, and there he began to need. Now, for the first time in his life, he feels, I mean, when he was under the father's care, he was doing good. He gets his wealth. He squanders it. He doesn't engage in, you know, great spending habits. And then a famine comes. There's no money left, and he's in need. And so what does he do? He goes out, and he basically asks to get hired out and to, feed the pigs, and while he's feeding the pigs, he even longs for his stomach to be filled with the pods that the pigs are eating. He's so in need, he literally cannot even provide a meal for himself anymore. But no one gave him anything. So he comes to his senses, which you and I would too. Maybe you're there right now where you feel like, I I literally have nothing, and that is me. I, I am in this place of need. He comes to his senses, and he says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. And so a couple verses later, we see him pick up, and he runs, or he goes, he goes to the father. All right, so I'm going to flip this. This is all real depressing at this point, all right? Let me show you if this is where you are. If you are in a place of stress, I want to show you that if you will be willing to go to the father today, He has some principles that can bring you some peace in your finances. And when you have peace, you will have joy, all right? And so if you're stressed financially, let me help you with some peace. Now, here's the good news. 
is he is our heavenly father, our savior. He is the prince of peace. Look at what Isaiah said about Jesus. And we read this a lot at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name, his character, what is true about him, the nature of him, it says, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So I'm going to look at this word real quick, Prince and Peace. Two little words that you would find in the Greek. Number one is Prince, this. The word Prince means Lord, Chief, General, Captain, the one in charge. All right? So a lot of us want peace alone. Rest, tranquility, wholeness, completeness, contentment, right? We want this in our finances. We want the shalom. We want the peace. Well, if you want the peace, you've got to let him be the prince of that peace in your life. And so when you let him be sar shalom, prince of peace, lord, general, captain, the one in charge. See, when he's in charge, when he's the prince of it, the peace can come. And so the peace comes when he's the prince of your finances, when he's the one in charge of your finances. And so if you're stressed financially, I would encourage you, are you willing to take a step back and turn your finances over to him? I'm not saying give him your wallet, but I am saying give him your wallet. Now, that is not me saying, all right, like give to the church today. No, I'm saying you've got to say, God, this is my money. Will you give me wisdom with it? I am, I, am, I, am, I am just going to steward anyways what you have given to me. So will you help me manage it? Will you help me in my spending? Would you help me in my lack? See, most of our stress when it comes to finances comes from ignoring, I would say, God's principles. God has so many principles in Scripture. And if you go through, you know, Financial Peace University, we'll give you like 15 more on top of this. But I want to give you four quickly, all right, in the last 10 minutes. Number one is this, principle of peace, number one, is you got to learn to be content, content. And so here the prodigal son is, he wanted more and he wanted it now. The opposite really of that is contentment. See, more just, it, 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 it's a bad pursuit. And in our life, if we're going to have, you know, joy in our finances, more can't be the pursuit, peace has to be. And one of the best ways to get peace in our heart in the area of our finances is to live a life of gratitude. Contentment comes best in our lives when we are thankful for what we have. I know you want a bigger, you know, house. I know you'd like to drive a nicer car. I know you'd like to do better for your kids. I get all of that. But in your pursuit of that, in your pursuit towards it, Can we not miss being grateful for what God has given us? No matter if you make an hourly wage or a salary salary (laughs) wage. What if we were just grateful for it? Saying, God, thank you for my portion. I'm not going to wait to show gratitude until I have what I think I need. I'm going to show gratitude for what I have now. See, God's not going to mistake your gratitude, okay, for, for a desire of you not wanting any, you know, any kind of forward movement in your finances. No, he's just like, are they even grateful? They're asking me for more. Are they even grateful for what I've already given them? There's something about starting with gratitude and contentment that has a way of bringing peace to your finances. See, in Psalms 23, we read this, that the Lord is my shepherd, I will lack nothing. It's so interesting when we learn to be content, when we learn to allow him to be Shar Salon, the Prince of Peace in our lives. When he is the shepherd, when you give the shepherd his job back, I think you can put him on the hook for lacking nothing. Now, this does not say when I lack nothing, meaning I'll have a pool. (laughs) I'm going to Disneyland. No, but you'll lack nothing. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly your situation. 
He knows what you need to fulfill the call and the purpose that he's put on your life and your family. Philippians uh, uh, 4.11 says this, learn to be content whatever your circumstances. Hebrews said, keep your hands free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Guys, if you're not content with what you have, when you get more, you'll never be content with that either. It just is what it is. You'll always want more. And it'll come with a price because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so we've got to learn to just slow down, just appreciate what we have. I'm not saying don't have ambition to continue to grow, grow your family, grow your business. I'm just saying in your pursuit of growth, can you appreciate the blessings that you have today in front of you? Number two is this, learn to live with margin. So Uncle Dave would say create a budget and stick to it. Now, listen, whether you are, you know, 18 or 65, like you're never going to not need this. Right? The wealthiest people I know still have budgets. They, they still understand P&Ls. They understand what it looks to, you know, allocate, to tell their money where it's going, not just, you know, Let it just go wherever it goes. Look what Dave Ramsey says about a budget. He says this, a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. I love that. Anybody ever been there? You're like, where did it all go? Robert Morris said this, and I think this is such a strong statement. He said, many believers aren't aware of this. He's a pastor. He wrote about money significantly. You can read a book called The Blessed Life that he wrote. He said, many believers aren't aware of this, but every time you get paid, you're facing a test. Here's the test I think you're facing. Who's Lord of it? Are you, are you, going, to, are you going to allow him to have control over this area of your life, or are you going to try to steward it all yourself? It's just a great test. You want wisdom? Well, you've got to let him be the captain, you know? And so he's there ready to help you, But you've got to turn it over to him. You've got to let him help you manage the thing that you think you put in your hands anyways. Look what Haggai says, because here's the opposite of that. The opposite will be this. It says, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted, but harvested little. You eat, but never enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put clothes on, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. My dad used to always tell me this every time I got an allowance growing up. Boy, is that money burning a hole in your pocket? Like, man, I've had holes in my pocket since then. You know, it's like, I guess I never. And you're like that sometimes, right? You get that money, and maybe you are a saver, but most of America are spenders because there's always something we want. And there's always something that the algorithm has a really, really good, you know, like grasp on as far as like what I need in my life. And so when I get money, of course there's a hole in my pocket because the algorithm told me I wouldn't be happy if I didn't have that. And so I've got to learn to have a budget and I've got to learn to stick to it because if not, I'll just end up barreling myself in debt, spending what I don't need because I think that I need to have it. And so that's just one of them. Here's Proverbs 21 says this, a wise man saves for the future, but a foolish spends just whatever he gets. He just kind of lets it go. If the card's still swiping, we're good. And even if it doesn't, I think I got some credit on the other one. Look, I, I get it. Everyone's in a different place. And maybe there's an amount of money that you make. You're thinking there's no way I can save. I get it. What you're saving now on that amount doesn't look like you know, what you want to save one day if you made this amount. But you've got to figure out how to get some of these principles in your life now because your behaviors won't change later. And so I was talking to um, somebody after the first service, and and they said this, that, that they had a budget that was so religious that they stuck to it so much when their kids were growing up that uh, there, there, were, there were months they called macaroni months, that it just was what it is. They, they did the budget, they paid all the bills, and then they told the kids right after that, this is macaroni month, which means everybody knew they weren't going out to eat because they just, they knew the budget, they had a plan, and they, they stuck with it. Yeah. 
instead of just doing whatever they wanted to do. Principle number three is live a life of generosity. And so if you'll begin to be content with what you have, if you'll begin to create a budget, you can live generously. What I know about all of you, whether you've tapped into it or not, all of you want to be generous. I've never met a person that just said, you know what, I don't really want to be generous. Life's all about me. No, I think innately in everybody, generosity is at our core. That we want to be generous people. We want to be generous with our time. We want to be generous with our resources. Luke 2, 15, or 12, 15 says this. It says, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Culture tells us life is measured by how much you own. The definition of culture for, for, you know, our lives and wealth and happiness right now is if you own a lot, you're good. But life, the Bible says, is not measured by just what you own. If you measure life by just what you have financially, you're never going to be fulfilled. There's going to be a true lack of joy. And so you've got to beware of every kind of greed that just says it's all about me and what I can do for myself. And you know what I mean? We just got to be cautious of that. See, you know what's crazy as far as life is not measured by how much you own? I said this the first service, and apparently some people hadn't heard this before. But I worked at a funeral home growing up uh, in, in college and worked for it for several years. And there's an old saying that is this, I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. Meaning, you can't take any of it with you. And if you do, and if you die with a pocket full of money, your kids are going to take it. I promise you. It will not be. I mean, they just, anybody with kids know that's how they are. Like, gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. Right? (laughs) Corinthians says this, remember. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generous. It's interesting that the world of the generous, the Bible says, gets larger and larger. God loves generous people. You know what he does with generous people? Gives them more to be more generous. It's, it's crazy. He just loves generosity. And so each one of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here will always be our theology on giving at our church. The core of it is be pre-deciders. If you're a tither, pre-decide to be a tithe. Show up and not do it just because we told you to do it. Be a pre-decider. Determine this is what it's going to look like for him to be Lord of my finances in my life. That however you would give, it wouldn't be because he's about to start the keyboards and it's going to sound amazing and you're going to feel guilty. It won't be because I twist your arm with a smooth sermon. But it'd be kid, you predecided as him being Lord of my life and Lord of my finances. I'm gonna be generous. I'm gonna be a giver. See, generosity isn't just an action, it isn't just a transaction you do. It is actually a character trait that I, I think can begin to be developed in you. That as you begin to make that what you think is a transaction, it puts something on the inside of you that awakens. Part of, I think, just your very DNA, who God created you to be, that at our core, God has made us all generous people. There's nothing that demonstrates the love of the Father through us more than us being generous. There's nothing that shows a selfish world the love of God better than our generosity. For God so loved the world that He is a giver. He gave His own. What a generous God. Number four is this, and I'll speed through this. Number four is just learn to depend on God. When it comes to your finances, go to him and start asking wisdom. James says this, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives what? Generously. Generously. Without finding fault, it will be given to you. If there is a lack of joy in your finances, and a lack of joy is not always broke, You may have more than enough today and still feel not fulfilled. So if there's a lack of joy in your finances and in the money that is in your bank account or lack thereof, 
then you should step back and say, God, will you give me wisdom on managing this? Will you give me wisdom on spending this? And if you ask him, he will give it to you generously without finding fault. I think that's why when I read things like this, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. But anything you ask, you will receive and your joy will be complete. So when I ask and I receive, it brings joy. And you know what I'm learning that God wants me to ask? I think he wants me to ask for wisdom. I don't think he wants me to ask for a Bentley. I don't think he just wants me to ask for a vacation. I think he wants to give me wisdom on how to handle what he's done. And with that wisdom, many times comes more wealth. It's funny that when we begin to steward what we have better, how much more we have. But then also, as we begin to steward what God gives us in a generous way, he says, I want to give more to flow through that. Generosity is huge. Seeking God is huge in this. Here's the bottom line of everything that I said today. If you are stressed with money, if there is a lack of joy with your finances, you allow him to be the prince of peace. Meaning, you make him captain, general of your finances. Say, God, you're in control. Let me manage it well you do that it will bring joy if you're not doing that let me encourage you to do today the same thing that the prodigal did would you get up would you go to your father so that's what I want to ask you to do today if there's a sense of joy that is missing in this area go to God say God I've been doing it on my own I'll invite you in now maybe you're doing a great job You already knew all this, but this was the one missing piece. You've got a great budget. You've got the lifestyle you want. But you're still a little empty. Make him Lord of your life. Watch what he might do. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes all over this room? Just want to ask you two questions today. My heart every week is for you to not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer as well. Here's what I want to ask you today to do. I want you to ask God in this moment, God, what would you have me do in light of today's sermon? What needs to stick out? What am I supposed to do about it? Father, I pray that you would speak to your people. God, I pray that you would give them wisdom. God, I pray as we learn to manage our money well, that God's stress would be pushed out and joy would come flooding in. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray.